Welcome to the Woman Inc. podcast. This is the place for the new generation of women looking to lead the life of their absolute dreams. I'm your host, Jenna Toddy, entrepreneur, life coach, and strategist for modern businesswomen and entrepreneurs. I am a city girl, sriracha lover, and that friend who will hype you up when you forget how powerful you truly are. I am on a mission to make Women Inc. the most powerful network of women who are leveling up, owning what they want, and becoming who they've always wanted to be. Have you ever wondered what it would look like if you went all in on yourself? No turning back. If so, you are in the right place, my girl. Let's get started. Hello, you beautiful people. My guest today is my ultimate girl crush and the friend I look to for inspiration constantly. Diana Cohen is the founder and CEO of Crown Affair, a clean hair care brand that empowers people to redefine their relationship with their hair through products, guidance, and community. For anyone looking to start a brand, pay close, close attention to how Diana thinks through product, storytelling, and connecting to customers through every little detail of the brand. I hope you love this episode and soak in all of the wisdom that Diana brings. There is truly no one else I would choose to teach you about launching product and building a mindful brand. Make sure to listen all the way to the end and come over to the Woman Inc. Podcast Instagram to let us know your favorite part. Now, let's get over to my conversation with Diana. Hello, my love. Hi. Uh, how are you? Oh my God. Your hair looks amazing. My hair is, I have so many hair stories for you, Diana. <laughs> I'm so excited. Let's talk about all of them. <laughs> yeah. So first I am so incredibly excited to get this time with you. All of the questions I have for you are quite selfish and the things I personally want to learn from you. You know this, you inspire me constantly. Oh my gosh. No, girl, you are one of the first people who believed in me and I feel so honored to be on here and be a part of what you're building. I mean, we could probably talk for hours, but I'm like really excited and I want to hear about every, I mean, I, we need a proper like four hour catch up after this. So (laughs) no, we're going to focus on you and tell the people all of the things. So if you'll bring us back to before crown affair, before levitate, when you are just graduating NYU and you're like, what am I going to do with my life? Or did you just know you had a vision? So it's such a great question because I did have a very strong vision in my life when I was growing up. In high school, I was totally the artsy kid who loved Tumblr. All I wanted to do was go to New York. If you ask someone I went to high school with what they remember probably about me, and part of it was just being the person that wanted to go to NYU. And I think so many people feel feel that way about New York and just knowing that they want to be here. So I did know that I'm still here, almost 12 years strong, still hanging out. Um, That I had a lot of clarity on. I've also always loved design and storytelling. And I didn't actually have the vocabulary for it, but I loved marketing. I don't think I really knew that marketing was a thing or a term. And it's so funny because I came to NYU, I studied art history and some business minor at Stern. It was very chill. It was not like a a proper Stern education, but and did Italian as well. I love just being around storytelling, I think. And that was what so much of art history was for me. But I took an intro marketing class and the professor at the time, I think this was my sophomore or junior year, had his friend come in and do like a couple sessions with us. I think he spoke two or three times and it was Gary Vaynerchuk, Vaynerchuk, however you say his name, but it was like for VaynerMedia. He had launched his family's wine business and really took it from this little shop with like an email list and converted it, or it didn't even have an email list. It was like a sign up list at the wine shop. And he really told the story of building this entire grassroots ecosystem. And 
he was really kind of crude and daring. He literally was cursing every fifth word and I just loved it. And this was before like, social media was what it was. He, I think he was like, his purest form of, of who he is and what we see now on the internet. But yeah, I just, I loved what he was saying. And I think that was the moment that it clicked for me that I wanted to be a marketer. And I was really lucky when I was in college, I got to intern at a ton of different fashion houses. I interned at Valentino for two semesters and celebrity styling and PR, which was like such an education. Um, it was like during Oscar seasons and we would have cool girls come in all the time, and fit them for stuff. And, you know, I knew very clearly that that is not what I wanted to do for my like full-time job, but to be able to have access to that and kind of see that whole universe and how important relationship building is, how important it is to kind of build these connections with people as you're building a brand, whether it's a heritage legacy brand like Valentino, or when I interned at Takoon and it was the first season that Moda Operandi launched. And I remember their core team, it was Lauren Santa Domingo. That whole crew came in produced the shoot. I was like, totally a fly on the wall and like fetching things. So it was not like I had a sexy job as an intern, but just really interesting overhearing the conversations of what the future of e-commerce could be. And I remember I had a really clear moment and to answer your question, which is when you graduated, did you know what you wanted to do? The answer is no, but during my time at school, it it was so clear how much the world was changing, especially around e-commerce and consumer. And I just was like, all the jobs that I've been dreaming of these last four years in, in Florida, you know, growing up in high school are just no longer relevant. And it was actually during that launch of Moda Operandi that I was like, there's just all, all of these wholesale jobs, like we'll be gone. <laughs> like I can't apply for these jobs because the internet is properly taking over. So I got really lucky. My last internship, which turned into a role was at Into the Gloss back in 2012. And that was when it was Emily and Nick. Her name was Alessandra was another, I think was her name. I'm like trying to remember the people there, Elizabeth. And it was like a five person team running a website. And it was primarily ad revenue that it was really just starting to tick up and I just sent Emily a cold email and was like, I love what you're doing. I'm a random person, but I just, I want to be a part of any of this. And I, I learned so much. I mean, I remember our first, one of the first shoots when NARS wanted to be on the site as a paid partner and just helping produce that campaign and being really scrappy, but super thoughtful and running new impossible projects and like getting the Polaroids down on Canal Street and then finding a model on Instagram. Pretty sure this model has like a million followers now, but at the time she had like 3,500, which was huge back then, you know, I had like two followers and, you know, just ordering the smile to go, which for those who don't know, is like a little takeout spot and, you know, working all day on Saturday to get these beautiful images. And I think that was really the turn of people responding to content like that, NARS or any huge beauty brand would obviously also produce their own campaign that is hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, but it was just so cool to see that immediate response with the community online to content that was really what we now call UGC or lower touch produced content. But yeah, I got lucky. And I even think that about my team now, one of our team members, she was an intern for me her senior year when Crown Affair wasn't launched yet. And now she's a full-time team member. Mm -hmm. And I think there's just a very fortunate transition if you do go to school somewhere that you can also have internship opportunities that turn into full-time roles. So you're a little bit less stressed after college, but yeah, that's, that's where it all started. And it's just kind of all snowballed from there. And I feel as though you have worked at so many companies that have become huge and such great successes. How do you think that you were able to have these instincts that these were going to be great companies, being that you were coming around during such early days? Yeah. Well, first and foremost, I mean, I feel so lucky and privileged to be able to take those risks, to be able to see something that I love as a customer. And I think that is the very simple answer, which is I loved it before I started doing it. And whether that was into the gloss away, even outdoor voices, Harry, is you just feel a connection to these, to these brands. And some of them were in pre-launch. So it's just, I kind of saw something online. A lot of it was just the people too. I think, you know, I say this to everybody always asking about 
roles and opportunities. Yes, it's amazing to work at a Nike or a wherever, like a big company. But I would have just preferred to be sitting in a room with Phil Knight in the 80s. You know, I don't care if there's just a desk and a broken file cabinet. And I think you have to be okay with that. I knew very early on that I was really addicted to having a direct impact. I also have friends who are incredibly talented marketers, et cetera, who genuinely prefer working at L'Oreal and the structure of those companies and the impact that they have on a global scale. So I think knowing yourself and what you want to, how you want to have your work make an impact is really critical. Absolutely. That is such great advice, especially for those who have recently graduated trying to navigate this market. I think that, you know, the Nikes of this world are definitely enticing, but you can easily feel like a small person in a big company where you are majorly lacking visibility and access to those C-level execs or founders, whereas you are able to closely observe and learn from these people every single day. Totally. And it's so funny. One of our customers who's just like also a community member, she's currently a senior at Yale and she interned last summer at Facebook and she's graduating and already has a really killer job lined up with somebody who's incredibly impressive and known as a female leader in this world. And she's really excited, but she's like, I also kind of feel like I'm going to this place and like, I want to be sitting with a founder. I want to be making an impact, but I was telling her there's actually so much value in that too. You are going to learn how the structures and systems of one of the most truly impactful companies is in the world. And there's always time, I think, to do both. I'm totally coming from a place of only ever working at startups and that that might be a detriment as well, but it's worked out so far. (laughs) (laughs) Most definitely has. I would love to now fast forward a bit to when you started your consulting agency, Levitate, which is when I met you. You have to tell the story of how you came up with the name Levitate because I love this story. And then walk us through, if you will, how transitioning through your first company led you to your current company, Crown Affair. So after Into the Gloss, I got really lucky. I met a woman who's still my mentor to this day named Eric Katz. She's currently the co-founder and co-CEO of a supplement company or prebiotic, symbiotic. She can explain it way better than I can called Seed. And she's just one of the most brilliant grassroots marketers I've ever known, have had the privilege to work for and with as a thought partner. And she hired me as her first hire at this mobile shopping app called Spring. Spring no longer exists today, RIP, but it was a really special time in e-commerce. It was the beginning of the direct-to-consumer revolution and so cool to meet all these founders and connect with them and understand what made people excited about product and brand in such a direct way. You know, we had over 300 brands on the platform at launch and it was an amazing experience. During that process, I I was able to meet so many brands and, and talk to them about what was working for them, understand their customers. Since then, have continued to work in consumer. So when I did have the opportunity to start my own consulting business with Levity, I had just been in, in contact and really built deep relationships to understand how to launch a brand, you know, how to, to build a cult community and products. Before launching Levity, I was at a luggage company called The Way was the eighth employee there and was head of partnerships. And, you know, you just learn so much about collaborating with people. And with that experience, I think it was a few years between Into the Gloss and starting Levitate. I was able to get a couple clients um, who were excited about working together and having me bring my experience and skill set to their their businesses. My first client was Outdoor Voices. I had touched and done a lot of influencer back in the day. And the influencer industry, we could probably have a podcast entirely dedicated to it. So, you know, it, it's evolved quite a bit, though. I mean, influencer really started early days into the gloss. That was the beginning of telling stories from people in their own channels. Outdoor Voices at the time had asked to have me come on and work on a strategy for building out their influencer and ambassador and celebrity program. And they ended up being a client for two years. It started as a three month project. And I always say that to people. I'm like, when you're starting consulting, just take the project and see how it goes. You're not going to have every answer of how to sign a 12 month contract in advance, because I mean, we've seen it this year, the world is changing and quickly. So you noted 
the name of the agency. It actually came to me when I was a full-time employee at Away. I was watching a documentary on HBO called The Defiant Ones, which is a documentary for those who haven't seen it with Jimmy Iovine and Dr. Dre. We all know and love both of them, particularly Dr. Dre, go-to karaoke songs. Um, <laughs> and uh, no, and, and Eminem, you know, they both built this empire together, having launched and sold Beats to Apple, which is incredibly impressive. I think it was $3 billion. That is no small feat. And Eminem was describing the relationship between them. I don't really watch many interviews with Eminem, so it was a whole new perspective. And he was saying that, Dr. Dre is the innovator and Jimmy is the levitator. I wrote it down in my notepad. This is why it's always good to keep notes in your phone. I just loved the idea that you could be a fully formed person, an entrepreneur by solely levitating innovators. There's so many incredible people with remarkable ideas. I've just always found myself lighting up when I'm with people like that. And Jenna, you know this well, like I'll sit with anybody and I'm like, wait, okay, let's build it into this thing. And um, that was such a fun journey. I, I, I loved levitating and I still levitate. I, I'm not taking clients now, but one of my favorite things is to sit with founders and just brainstorm, whether it's through a launch or a new product or brand positioning. I just, it, nothing, very few things fill me up as much as that. I love it. And so I remember I ran into you, we were running out of So House and you're like, I have to catch you up. I'm doing this hair thing. And I'll tell you about it later. <laughs> and then I think a month later, I had the most beautiful box I've ever seen in the mail of your incredible product. I am so obsessed, truly, with Crown Affair. I am just blown away by how you create companies. To me, you do it in this the most beautiful way. All of the details are so thought out. So I just have to know your process. I need to get inside of your head and understand you have this idea. Can you walk me through how you go about making this a reality? Yes. And I love, first of all, thank you. I'm fully blushing over here, <laughs> big time. No, I, I, and I love talking about the nitty gritty of this because I think the entrepreneurial journey can seem so aspirational or like you can't, you know, it's this thing that arrives all at once. It does take time. And the idea for Crown Affair first came to me. Well, one step back, I'm obsessed with hair. It is the part of my, you know, how I take care of myself, my identity. It's something that I've always invested in. I've always done research in. Truth is with skincare and makeup, I'm pretty simple. I'm very much like a no makeup makeup person. And I totally just use Cetaphil or whatever. My dermatologist, to, you know, I, I have a couple fun products, but Hair was kind of the category in beauty for me that always explored and, and had fun with. So somehow along the way, I became the person that friends would text is they were going through different kind of milestones or journeys with their hair. Diana, I'm stopping to do keratin. How do I start taking care of it? Or I really need a shampoo that doesn't have sulfates. Or I would just be that person. And I've just done a ton of research at this point. A friend was just asking me about another treatment and she's like, you need a column. And I was, you know, whether it's with me or not, I'm just so fascinated by it as a fiber and levels of moisture with it. And then really how daily care for it can transform over time. It was very clear that this is one of the few categories in beauty that I think we just feel really disempowered around. It's like, I have to go to my stylist or my salon or it's not professional. It's not good, you know, in terms of like good hair or hair goals. And I just never connected with it or related to it. So that I knew there was something there. There was an insight there. Also some of my favorite products I didn't actually feel connected to the brand at all, whether that was like a super over the top hot pink bottle, but like the product was fire or like conversely, I love Orbe, I've used Orbe, I will continue to use Orbe, but not super clean. I don't really know. It's just like a professional style. Like I don't really know the story and I, I don't feel connected to most brands in this category. So it's, it's very, I mean, also 80% of the premium market is owned by the same three people. It's all L'Oreal and, you know, it's, it gets kind of limiting. There's not a ton of innovation. So that was where it first started. And I was still consulting and I was saving money. So I could putting some money away to start working on product development I started with the brush and the combs just because very candidly, 
hiring chemists, minimum order quantities, it's, it's expensive. It adds up really quickly and tools, finding the right vendors and partners all over the world in Italy and Switzerland and just creating custom molds. And it definitely took longer and was more of a craftsman approach, but I was just so excited to send them the $200 hairbrush I'd been using and we'd cut it open and understand the density of the bore and nylon bristle distribution and how to shape the handle and finding materials like recycled beech wood for the brush or for the combs, finding a plant-based acetate that was still really sturdy and beautiful. And this thing that you're like, oh, this makes me happy to take care of my hair. It's not just this random plastic comb from the gym or a drugstore and That was where that started. And then as I was getting samples and self-funding at that time, I handed out about 30 samples to friends to get their feedback. And I gave them my personal ritual of how I would take care of my hair with these tools. And more than half of them were like, how was I not brushing my hair? You know, there's like, there's like levels to it and I get it. And the biggest thing is people are like, oh, I can't brush my hair when it's curly. It'll poof. I'm like, no, I know. But like before you go to bed, when you're not like going to see anybody except for your pillow, brush from top of your head to the bottom to move the natural oils through your hair. Or before you get in the shower, brushing your hair to get rid of the debris and build up will actually have like more clean and even wash. And it just, it was, it was so cool to see the transformation. And actually my fiance's best friend from childhood who, who helped me launch this, he's a bioengineer and chemist and I had sent him and his wife this Google Doc that I put together of my ritual and what to do. And he was like, it is crazy what's in some of these products. This has been banned in the EU for years. This ingredient, cyclopentasiloxine, which is the lead ingredient in the most popular hair oils, coats your hair and feels good temporarily, but long-term it actually dries it out. And that opened up a whole other universe of skew count is not the issue in this category, whether you're going to a beauty supply store and you're in an aisle and you're like, where do I start? Or you're at a beautiful luxury salon and there's five products and they're all $60 for shampoo or whatever. But it just became so clear that there was not only brand, a brand that I didn't feel emotionally connected to, but there was also just so much noise in this category and it felt really dated. So after kind of that proof of concept of sampling product, getting feedback, having a very smart person also be like, there's something here, which is always a good vote of confidence. We decided to, to raise money. And I, I put together a deck. It was about 14 pages and had some numbers and insights into the category. But, you know, the truth is, is I, I really don't believe there's anybody else doing what we're doing around care and ritual and clean and luxury. And, you know, we saw brands like Drunk Elephant and Tatcha and Sunday Riley really rise over the last decade, right? That have served this space at a more accessible price point than La Prairie or La Mer. But before that, it was kind of just the luxury guys, or it was Clarins and Clinique and, you know, think like your mom's department store products. So I, I'm really excited about what we're doing and it's continued to become super clear. Yeah. So that, that was, we're like, okay, we can do this for real. And then obviously you raise money, you launch, and that's a whole journey in itself too. I feel like we could talk for hours just about raising money, especially for women feel that very few people talk about the process of raising money, how intimidating that may be to walk in and pitch your idea. And you had some experience through being at startups, but how did you prepare for those meetings? Were you hitting up your friend, like, let me practice this pitch? Or were they mostly people you knew you felt comfortable? Yeah, I, a combination. I mean, I took over 200 investor meetings. So you get pretty good. Yeah, I think I took, I have to check. I think I took two, almost 230 investor meetings. By the way, the, the first three were the most important ones that ended up being the people that really got what we were doing and decided to be, a, you know, were the right partners to, to lead the round. But I think the first thing for women, men, everybody is when you go in to pitch somebody or connect with someone, you have to remember that you are giving them a huge opportunity. You are about to do a lot of work and give your life to this thing. And, you know, this partner gets to be along for the ride and check in. <laughs> you have to, you know, I also think, and we're seeing this with COVID, you just have to be you there are going to be so many variables that you cannot control in the world. So for an investor, I think it's really about betting on the founder and knowing that they can build a really strong brand that can go in so many directions and that you can pivot. I mean, 
one never hopes to launch a brand and then a global pandemic happens. I, I don't recommend it. It's been, I mean, it's been fine. I'm, I'm obviously saying that as a joke, there are a million other things that are much more important, but I think it's important to know that going in as a founder, that your product will change. If you don't laugh at the first product that you launch, then you're probably not moving quick enough or innovating enough. So I think that's really important. And then doing your research, as you noted, I was really lucky to be a part of over 10 fundraises as an employee. Do not mistake, I was not pitching anybody in the room, but I put together, you know, slides for the deck on partnerships or marketing. Maybe it wasn't the first fundraise, but it was, you know, series A or series B. So you realize what an implication that has on the business and the team. So we were really smart um, with asking questions, getting advice from previous founders about their learnings and what they had done when they were negotiating their term sheet. And I think the most important thing is it is really a a marriage and you have to have the same philosophies and principles. So I knew very clearly that I did not want a VC that was about growth at all costs and spend a million on paid, do a million in revenue. I mean, that's one way to have perceived value being like, we did a million in revenue this month, but you spent a million dollars on acquiring customers. So finding investors really early. I mean, it's, it's, it really is a relationship and marriage. So we were like, cool, if we spend this understanding those terms and how you want to grow the business. And I think this year, a lot of people are recognizing that building a strong brand with high repeat purchase rate of really amazing customers is probably better than acquiring customers that aren't repeat purchasing and you're spending a ton of them. For example, mattress brands, things like that. It's definitely a shift in the consumer headspace. And I'm very candid that I was lucky to be able to take, you know, people were excited to take meetings because of my background, but you'd be surprised sending an email to somebody getting in their DMs. If you have an idea, I even find that I have so much respect for people that write a really thoughtful email. You'd be surprised. Yeah, that really does go a long way. Just the little details. So when you are launching a product, a new product, what does your day look like? Post-it notes everywhere. What's your process? Uh, Yeah, I'm excited to talk about this because I don't talk about it that often. Well, so launching a product is probably my favorite. I love launching things. It's just so much fun. It's definitely not easy, but the energy around bringing something to market and seeing how people are going to respond and planting seeds and involving people on the process. And then when it goes live, it's just like such a cathartic and fun feeling. And we try to recreate that with every product launch that we have. And I think there will be some big ones in the new year and kind of new spaces of hair care that I'm excited about. But you know, my process is, I mean, I, I, I'm on my computer and my phone quite often. I have accepted the fact that I am not an OCD organized person. I think embracing the chaos of you're going to have three different notepads, a, you know, an email draft open with your to-do list, also Asana, also Slack. Me putting pressure, being hard on myself for not being perfectly organized is not a productive use of energy. So I very much just kind of acknowledge that that is my flow. And I do the best that I can to prioritize things through the day. I also really light up when something fun comes my way. So I try to act on that in the moment when I feel inspiration. I've gotten much better with my schedule in terms of project management. So I really pace my days and meetings accordingly. So much of what I do is external facing and as our, our president, Elaine, would say, I'm so much more useful externally, which is kind of a joke because I'll jump in and I'll be like, they're, they're like, we've got this. Just just go talk to people and, and, you know, spread the gospel of Crown Affair. And it's what I love doing. You know, I get energized by this. I mean, I am on one hand an introvert. Like, I think everybody has that about them. I love journaling. I could take a bath three days a week. I love staying at home and just all of the care and rituals. And it's really funny. My fiance, Alex was like, your whole life is just rituals now. Like you take 30 minutes in the bathroom because I do my whole post shower hair ritual. And then I lymphatic drain with a paddle tool. And then I do gua sha. It makes me feel whole. Like I re I just buzz, you know, when I do these things. So I very much honor that. And I take the space to honor that. And I think There's definitely a perception that in order to be an entrepreneur, you need to be hustling 24 seven, but I would not be living my brand mission and ethos if I was not taking my time to take care of myself. And 
I have to tell you by putting that into practice. And this year has obviously been a catalyst for that. I have no excuse. I'm home 99% of the time, unless I'm at the grocery store. So this year has been really special to give back to myself to actually produce better quality work. Yeah, that is so important. And I think people are really waking up to this, that you will be such a better entrepreneur if you're able to first take care of yourself. Totally. I've started to speak to this a little bit, but people are always like, do you have work-life balance or how do you balance it? And it's not so much balance as it is harmony. We are, at least for, I mean, for us and for me, we're from a generation where your work is your life and your life is your work. And I think For people who are like, I don't really care about my work. I just do this as a means to live my life. To have that awareness and total clarity is I'm envious of it. That's sick to just be like, I'm hundred percent here for my life. And I do this job just as a job. And I think having clarity is really important. And I now have clarity that my life is my work and I love doing this. And once I think you change the perception that work is actually play it all just becomes one thing. I'm not strict about hours. If I need from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. on Tuesday to do whatever I need to do, then I'll do that. And I'll work at night, this like harmonious flow of all of it. And I think that not turning off or not being on your phone, it gets a little bit of a bad rap. Like we're always on, but I've acknowledged that it never stops. So why not embrace a way to find balance in that? You know, it's not like I'm working from nine to five only on work and then working from Uh, By the way, nine to five is not real hours, but you know what I mean? Like I figured out a schedule where it all works in harmony for me. That's amazing. How do you communicate that with your team? Do you have a weekly meeting? Do you have a daily meeting? How do you guys stay on track with each other knowing everyone might be on a different schedule? So our team is all remote right now for the most part. And we have a 10 a.m. daily standup just so we align across the company and priorities for the day. And then we make sure that we schedule our team meetings between 10 and 6-ish, you know, give or take. So no one should put a meeting on the calendar internally that's before 10 and no one should put it on after. And I think those are the hours that we really respect. That's not to say that things won't come up, obviously, not between those hours. But I came from really intense cultures around reply time, Slack culture. And I just want the opposite for my team and company and business. And I'm a very big believer that you empower people by giving them the space that they need. And I know I work better that way. I never want anyone. Can I take a vacation on Thursday and Friday? I'm like, I don't care. Live your truth. Get your work done. Live your truth. I don't like fear-based cultures having basically been raised in them. And I don't think that they're effective. And I don't think that the life of of your team will, will survive if it's fear-based. So we're, we're overly communicative, probably to a fault. <laughs> I love that. Oh, I love that. I think that is such an incredible message and a lot of companies can follow your lead in order to retain happy employees. So I'm very curious then on the days when you are just feeling so low energy and you have so much to do in that day, How do you get through that? How do you motivate yourself to keep going? It's really hard. I mean, working from home with Alex has actually been so great because when I don't feel wonderful, I'll literally just go over there and like hug him or like fall on top of him on the couch. It it makes me have perspective on what I need to just kind of feel good. It's hard. I mean, even today, I feel like today has been nonstop. I mean, we could do an entire, we probably should do an entire podcast on running a brand during a global pandemic, especially with things spiking. It's like, you just have to keep moving. And I think having resilience is the best trait for an entrepreneur. And I was actually recently listening to the Guy Raz interview where he was interviewed by Tim Ferriss. And I was really excited because he's interviewed so many incredible entrepreneurs. And I was like, this man must have so many patterns that he's recognized. And he was saying that resilience is the key thing. And I think just constantly getting up, even if something doesn't work. I also know about myself, I'm going to feel better if I do the work. I usually get a little more anxious or frustrated, but I'm like, you know what? This email is really only going to take four minutes. Let me just send it. But it's, it's hard. And I know that if I'm in my own head, I should step away and journal for a little bit. 
I know when I need to go for a walk. And I think also (laughs) accepting the fact, and this goes back to embracing the chaos, but I will just never have inbox zero. So prioritize. (laughs) I've had days where I will have a to-do list that could probably go on for three more days and I'll get in the shower. And I just say to myself, I'm like, you've done enough. And that's okay. There will always be more, but you've done enough today and that's okay. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Talks in the shower are where I have truly my favorite talks with myself. Same shower thoughts. And I take baths all the time now too, which is a new COVID ritual. And I, I just, I guess I used to think that they took too much time, but again, honoring that time for care has been so transformative. And that is where I grab my phone and write down thoughts and it's just quiet time. Yeah, that is so nice. So I have a fake Instagram where I follow only maybe 10 people who really inspire me. And I use this when I really just want to drain out the sound of Instagram. I don't really want to go full in and look at everyone. I just want to be able to curate what I want to see and be inspired by the people who I select to kind of bring me that inspiration. Do you have anyone in your life who you would say constantly inspires you, who you go to often for inspiration? Well, first of all, that is truly brilliant. And I'm going to take a page from your book and make an account. So if someone, I I guess it needs to be cryptic enough what my username is, but I love that. There are people who I've just looked to for a long time. I mean, Jane Goodall, I think is one of the most inspiring people and I can get totally lost in her feed and her and her team properly keep up on telling stories on social. So I think she's somebody that I would continue to look to. This isn't so much a person, but it's probably my favorite account is the National Bonsai Foundation in DC. It's so cute. They talk about taking care of bonsais and they'll introduce the trees. And I'm very, I'm very fascinated by trees and the, their stories. And I mean, if you look around, if you're surrounded by trees, there's a chance that they've been here longer than us and will be here much longer than us. So I love that they just really personify trees and kind of honor that care. Era, who I mentioned is just really so inspiring. She's, she doesn't post as much on social, but whenever I just need a moment of clarity, she's incredible. I'm also really inspired by art and the lives of artists. I'm definitely a shadow artist and I need to probably start thinking of myself as a creative, but I really admire the, it's not even bravery because it's just in their soul, but I, I definitely, there's probably a big list of artists that I think it's so cool to kind of operate and take the risk outside of these capitalistic structures to just share what is inside of you and be open and vulnerable. Last few people. I love Adam Grant, who is a behavior scientist. Yeah, you probably know and love Adam Grant. Only because I always end up following everyone who you talk about. Yes, I I mean, I love that. And and Adam Grant is truly so brilliant. And um, Seth Godin, who's a marketer as well. These are more nerdy marketing things, but I love Seth and what he has to say. And then, I mean, this is like an interesting podcast and someone I never think that I really have so much respect for. And it's going to sound so random if you haven't listened to it, but Dak Shepard, like the actor Dak Shepard, armchair expert, he has embraced vulnerability in a way that I think someone like Brene Brown teaches on, but he actually lives it. And he has incredibly vulnerable conversations. And I think it's open. I mean, listening to him the past like two to three years, it's really like opened up a part of me to feel more open to be vulnerable. I think in, in an industry where like it's always about perfection and entrepreneurship can be super glamorized. Okay, with one last one. <laughs> anything, <laughs> anything Pixar. I'm obsessed with everything Pixar. I've been a Pixar person forever. And I love diving into the insights of Pixar stories and films. I was listening to something on Toy Story the other day and how the insight was the whole premise of Toy Story is that toys just have a burning desire to be loved And it's clearly a reflection of the human condition, but there's something really beautiful about how they show really key insights in these characters that we fall in love with. And I think that is what means being a good marketer and understanding customers and what makes them excited. So those are my 10 follows that I would give. (laughs) (laughs) I have so many new people to add to my fake inspiration Instagram account now. So 
What would you say, Diana, you are most excited about in terms of the future of Crown Affair? This is a wild year to launch a business. So many of the playbook things that we might have done, whether it's with retailers or pop-up or growth, are kind of all TBD right now. So I'm excited to find how Crown Affair shows up in the world for people as a part of their day. And we want to continue to serve and deliver on that promise of bringing calm and joy and ritual to people's lives and hopefully making them feel more connected with their hair in a way that I was mentioning people have an expertise over their skincare routine. And I think just offering better quality, innovative products and having people kind of rethink their relationship to it will hopefully change the way that they move through the world and not feel so hard about being like, my hair is not quote good if I don't have a blowout, you know? And I think normalizing that this journey is journey versus selling a fix. I'm so excited about our products next year. I'm obsessed with them. And I always know that if I don't reach my original product that I was using, that it's it's a done deal and good to go. So we have a lot of new products launching and we'll see how it goes. Whole new world. I'm so excited for everything that you will build. And my last question is just your best advice that you would give to a woman who is just starting her own company or thinking about starting it. Gosh, there's so many. I mean, blinders is the first one. I think as women, as people, it's very easy. And this is why I love Jenna, that you have your Instagram of just inspiring people. I think it's so easy to constantly compare. And this is obviously in all areas of our lives, but if you really have a product idea or vision or whatever it is, blinders, mute it for a little, you can always unmute it or you can always resubscribe. That is, I think, really helpful advice to give you clarity and not be reactive. Very easy to And then I would say, share this, share this journey with people. I'm a very big believer, right? Like even seeing you at Soho House and being like, I'm doing this thing and talking about it. I do believe that people want to celebrate and share what they're a part of creating. So even one of our new products, we've been bringing in a group of people and editors to really try it and not in a fake way, in a legit real way of have them give feedback. And, you know, that way when it launches, we're not just sending a PR pitch. So it's this dry shampoo is launched, but these people are like, oh, I've been a part of building this. Every touchstone, even if you're just getting coffee with someone, you need to start building your army of people who adore you and what you're building. Don't keep it secret. Don't wait till it's perfect. Share this as you go and it's going to evolve. That is such good advice. And you really embody that, especially with how you share before you go live. I've learned a lot from you in that way of letting people in and you do feel like you're a part of the journey because you've already tested the product before you see it go live. And it is such a good feeling. Yeah, no, and it's and it's real and it's helpful. Like, I love to getting feedback that's positive or negative or somewhere in the middle. Even if someone doesn't reply to it, they might see something in their own life that they then send me. Just being a genuinely curious person is such a power because then you and me, for example, will share stuff or, you know, it's just, it's having a real authentic relationship and conversation with people, I think betters you as a founder. Yes. Diana, you are amazing. I am constantly blown away by you. Thank you so much for coming on. Feeling is so mutual. I feel like we need a part two. So if people are excited about certain things, we can like go deep. (laughs) Yes. Everyone reach out to Diana and tell her that we need a part two. (laughs) And where can everyone find you? So you can find us at Crown Affair on Instagram and crownaffair.com. We have all our handles, I think. So that's always lovely. And then my personal is Diana with two N. So D-I-A-N-N-A Cohen, spelled the normal way Cohen on Instagram and all other social. Yeah. Get in my DMs. Love, love a DM. And I love talking about all of this. So. Okay. I hope you enjoyed this episode and are feeling so fired up to go out there and create that business or side hustle that's been on your to-do list, you know, a little bit longer than you care to admit. It is never too late to make the first step towards the life you want more than anything else. If you haven't already, make sure you are subscribed to the show so that you never miss an episode. 
Thank you so much for tuning in. Until next time, keep becoming the woman of your wildest dreams.